welcome to the Dive into Reiki podcast, episode four, today with a very, very special guest, Caitlin Prasad. Caitlin is a founder of Animal Reiki Source and president of the Shelter Animal Reiki Association, Sara, a Reiki practitioner for over 22 years. She teaches and shares the healing benefits of Reiki meditation for animals and their caregivers. Caitlin has created the Lead Animal Lead Method of Animal Reiki. This method represents the world's first specialized extensive and professional curriculum in animal Reiki and meditating with animals for healing. Caitlin's nonprofit, Sara, shares and teaches animal Reiki for rescued animals and their caregivers in shelters and sanctuaries around the world. And honestly, for me, it's a great pleasure because uh, Caitlin basically invented the modality of animal Reiki. It wasn't a thing before she decided, why are we not doing this? So welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much for saying yes to this interview. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. I'm really happy to be here. And um, yeah, my Reiki story is, I guess, similar to a lot of people that I've heard where um it's unexpected and, and it sort of um, takes over when you had other plans, I guess, and maybe the best things in life are like that. Um, but I originally discovered Reiki through my mother-in-law and she wanted me to get a treatment because she had had a treatment and she lived in Denver at the time and I lived on the West Coast. So I had to fly out the next time I visited her and she set up this whole thing. Oh, you have to go get this treatment. And I'm like, Reiki, that sounds weird. And I was like, I'm, I'm like humoring her, right? That's like <laughs> why I did it. And um, I got that, that treatment, that first treatment. And it was so relaxing and peaceful and like more than more than peaceful but like like filled with well-being like filled with goodness and light and um and i had grown up with severe anxiety disorders so i was always stressed always nervous and when i had my reiki treatment i felt just good like everything was okay you know and um I just, I got up off the table. I felt like I was walk, like levitating a few inches off the ground. You know, I felt so light and like all my burdens had been lifted. I just felt so good. And I'm like, oh my God, th this is gonna heal my anxiety. And I had never, I never thought I would be able to be healed. Like I almost never even put that in my mind that I could heal my anxiety. I was just like, I'm an anxious person. Oh, well, I have to live with it, you know? And so just, the door opened that there was a possibility that my anxiety could be healed. And so I immediately dropped everything and had to learn Reiki. I found a local teacher. Um, I also ended up studying the next time I went to Denver with the teacher, my teacher, Martha in Denver and, um, and just Reiki from there on, like literally started every single day practicing Reiki and just totally dove into it. I dove into Reiki, Natalie. <laughs> right <from the> <laughs> Literally. Oh my God, I love that. It, it's funny how many of us with anxiety discover Reiki is one of the few things beyond medication that actually help us. As you say, like there is a possibility of feeling fine and not scared, which is beautiful. So how was that training? How, like what, did, what lineage did you train it at the beginning? So the two lineages I learned originally for the first seven or eight years um, was um, like Takata lineage or Reiki Shiki Ryoho. Um, one of my teachers was Reiki Alliance. So my Reiki Alliance teacher um, was actually very strict and um, here locally. And it was very like hands-on Reiki on, hands-off Reiki off. That was like how I originally learned. And um, my practice that I began immediately was this, you know, hands-on self-treatment every day as, as soon as I learned. And then my other teacher in Denver, Martha, she was much more um, less traditional and much more intuitive. She's also an acupuncturist. So she kind of brought in a lot of philosophy of Chinese medicine and um, just like that, that sort of spiritual teaching along with intuition. And so she was much more like, well, you know, 
your hands will guide you and you know you have these hand positions to start with but you can be more flowing you know and free with it and so um, I think it was kind of nice to have both of those teachers and both of those perspectives um, and in the beginning. Um, and so I think it gave me a really good foundation um, for what Reiki is and, and mostly for my own healing. And what I always teach my students now is that Reiki actually starts with you. And even though you're here for your animals, because everyone who comes to me wants to help their animals, right? <laughs> even though you're here for your animals, it starts with you. And I learned that really, really strongly from, from my first two teachers about that self-practice so that I was able to really focus on me. And it was interesting because when I was doing my self-practice, hands-on self-practice, that was when my dog, Dakota, came and laid on top of my feet in this really weird way that he never did. And he only did it when I was doing Reiki. And I'm like, what are you doing? And finally it dawned on me that he was like, like taking the, the Reiki space. You know, he was like helping himself to some lovely healing energy. And um, so I, I sat down on the floor and put my hands on him. He rolled on his side and he was like, finally, mom, geez, I've been trying to tell you <laughs> I want Reiki. And you finally, you know, cause it just didn't occur to me. I was so focused on my own healing. Um, so when Dakota kind of showed me that animals love Reiki, the other thing that, that it showed me, which was kind of like a light bulb moment was animals already know what it is. Like for me, I had to take a class. I had to like read about it. I was like, this doesn't, this is confusing. And then my teacher would be like, well, just practice it and it will make more sense, right? And my dog's like, Oh yeah, Reiki, totally. I, I got it. I got this. Totally get it. I'm, I'm taking this for healing. This is great. Thanks, mom. And I'm like, but how do you know? <laughs> so that was kind of like my, it, it was just so fascinating to me how animals are so energetically sensitive and also very wise about energy. And so that, that kind of brought me onto a little different trajectory with my Reiki practice. I mean, I was so like immersed in Reiki and I loved it so much and it was helping my anxiety so much that I, I thought, you know, I, I wanna do this. I wanna teach, this. It, be, it just became bigger and bigger in my life, but then the animals were coming forward and saying, but Kathleen, don't forget about animals. And I was volunteering at, you know, shelters and I was walking dogs and working with cats in shelters. And I was seeing amazing responses to Reiki from these animals that were very stressed. And I knew exactly how they felt because that was like my, my inner way of being <laughs> was stressed. And I'm like, oh, I know Reiki can help you because it's helping me. And, you know, Reiki with my horse, I would do Reiki with my horse and people would walk by the stall and look in and go, what are you doing? Can you do that for my horse? And I'm like, I don't know, I, I guess so. And so it just started like taking over, right? And that was kind of where, where, it, where it really began. And I, rem I still remember going to dinner uh, with my husband and my brother-in-law and I'm like, I thought I would teach middle school my whole life, but now I just, I feel so inspired about Reiki and also animals. And my brother-in-law's all, well, why don't you do animal Reiki? And I'm all, because nobody does animal Reiki. Like that's not a thing. And he's like, well, why don't you make it a thing? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, okay, I could, why not? I could make it a thing, you know? And that's like that conversation over dinner, like created something in me that, you know, I'm like, it's okay that I'm the only one who does this. It's okay that nobody understands. Like, I just knew in like the core of my being, like, this is my purpose. This is, this is what I'm supposed to bring to the world. This is what I'm supposed to do, you know? And so here we are, you know, 23 years later and Animal Reiki is a thing now. Yes. <laughs> you made it. No, I am really like surprised because Reiki was already not that known like 23 years ago. Animal Reiki is still like, as you say, like mostly you invented the modality. So it was really a big breakthrough at the time. 
And also it's funny because Reiki is becoming one with the universe, but we keep it very much limited to humans. So I love that you had that breakthrough. And I love that it was someone who was outside who could see with fresh eye, right? And give you that insight. Yeah. I think that's so beautiful. And I love in the pre-interview, you told me your teacher's reaction when you came like, I have this idea. Yeah, my, my very first teacher, she's like, no, you can't do that. That's not a thing. You, you have to do all your training with Reiki and then you have to teach Reiki for, for people. You can't do, that's just not a thing. And I was like, okay and then I went to my second teacher my teacher in Denver Martha and I'm like is this a bad idea this is what I'm thinking I want to do I want to focus totally on animals like I realized I've been focusing on humans for seven years and I was you know kind of on that path but that's just not it for me what do you think about this and she's like Kathleen that is the most amazing idea and if anyone is going to do it you're the person to do it and I've supported 110 percent and so that was kind of how I was like okay well you know because you you have to have a teacher that will train you in level three Reiki will train you to be a Reiki teacher in order to go any further so I had to like find that person and and Martha was that person for me and so I'm just really grateful that she like she saw potential and possibility where other people were like, oh no, no, can't do that. <laughs> no, and, and I, I just love that. And I, I think when we're talking, we're talking whole Reiki system, we have to respect the core and the modalities, but we have to express it through who we are in our practice, right? So for you, that's your expression. For me, it's a lot about uh, reporting or mixing it with martial arts. So we all have very different expression of Reiki, as long as we're true to who we are as people, right? Not, we don't do it for marketing value. So I think that is lovely. And tell me a little bit, because you also, even like the way you offer Reiki to animals at the beginning to what you do now, your system has evolved a lot. And I love that story. It moved me very much, not just because of animals and your story, but I think it's a great inspiration even about sharing Reiki with humans. So I would love if you can tell a little bit that evolution. Yeah. So you know, I, I love people too. And after all, we are, you know, animals also. <laughs> um, and um, I had a lot, my, my first teacher gave me a lot of um, experience. She would send clients to me and I was doing a lot of, I was going to hospices. I was working on hospital patients. I was going to people's homes and people would come to my home. So I was doing a lot of human, human treatments for the first seven years of my practice. And, um, I had a lot of really beautiful experiences with that. I think some of the most moving ones were the ones with hospice patients and really seeing like a deeper connection than just, you know, hands on for a sore knee or a sore leg, but something like more important, something bigger kind of going on. I think that that really um, moved me. And, you know, some of those treatments were not conventional because the, the person couldn't be touched or if they were in a hospital bed you could just sit and and kind of you know hold their hand and I remember um, my my neighbor got um, hit by a drunk driver and she got like a brain injury and I went in to to see her in the ICU to do Reiki and I sat down and I just I put my hand on her foot because that was the only play, I mean, she was so banged up, you couldn't touch her anywhere. And I'm like, well, this isn't, my teacher would not approve of this. This is not strict. This is, you know, I put my hand on her foot. I felt so much Reiki flowing through me. I, I got like pain all the way up my arms to my shoulders and just like just buzzing all over. So I knew that that healing connection was happening. And the nurse had said, you know, she's, she's out cold. She's on meds. She's not going to wake up, but you can sit with her. So I'm sitting with her and about 15, 20 minutes later, I hear this little voice, Kathleen, I knew it was you. And I'm like, she's awake, you know, oh, yeah. and she could only open one eye. She was all swollen and she had this, she's, her name is Stella and she has this adorable little voice, cute little voice for um, just adorable. And her little voice came out and she said, Kathleen, you know, I knew it was you. And she said, I felt like I was in the bottom of this black hole and I wanted to give up because I was in so much pain. And then I saw this light and I knew I was going to be okay. And she said, it felt like you pulled me up into the light. And I was like, 
it was so amazing to hear that, you know, from hear that because we don't get that kind of verbal feedback from animals, right? And and mm -hmm. I, I was like, wow, you know, I didn't even do the right positions or anything. You know, I was just sitting there with her, um, and I thought, you know, that that is what is happening when I go to a shelter and I sit with a dog and the dog is depressed and listless and there nobody home in their in their eyes they're just tuned out and i sit with them from outside the kennel and all of a sudden they they see me and they come over and wag their tail and i would even have dogs roll on their back for me to like reach through the the bars and rub their belly at the end of a session like they would just come back to to hope and to positivity through like reiki was just it was like pulling them up into the light that how she described it was like I when she said that to me I'm like I, I got the vision of all these shelter animals that I could see felt so much better after a Reiki session um and so it was like it was kind of like you know the human practice really gave me the verbal feedback for what people experienced and felt that I could see in animals it, it helped me make that bridge and trust a little bit more you know, but when I worked with animals, a lot of times I couldn't touch. In the beginning, I tried to just use the hand positions that I'd learned for people and, and put them on animals. Um, so I would, but I would never start at the head because animals don't like that. So I would start at the, the like shoulders and I would move down the body. And then I would end on the head when they were like really relaxed from Reiki or something. So that's how I began. And like my first book, Animal Reiki, really kind of shows that that type of thinking. It was really taking human protocol and and really modifying it, but doing it basically for animals. But I had a little problem with that because some animals were like, sure, that's great. Some animals were like, as I was doing it, they're like, looking kind of uncomfortable and then after like two minutes they would run away so i'd only get in like two minutes of reiki then some animals would be like oh hell no you're not doing that to me and they would totally run and then i'd be like but then they you don't get any reiki there's no there's no healing happening right and so i i started to that that feeling of like wanting to to help and to create that beautiful space of like pulling you into the light like bringing that well-being and in a, in a moment of suffering bringing you into that well-being i'm like you know how how do i how do i make it so that every animal feels safe and comfortable and i'm not like pushing too much with like all my here's some healing energy come come back i'm trying to help you running after the animals come back you know the the healing is for you right yeah, i've been there i've been yeah. running after a few cats yeah and i thought you know that that just didn't feel satisfying you know i would just like that didn't feel right it just wasn't good so i'm like how what do i do so that like if i would think in my mind okay who's like the most sensitive animal like let's say a feral cat right a feral cat is afraid of humans, doesn't, you know, want to be in a cage, wants to be free, is is really like their eyes get all big and they, you know, they when they see a person, they're just so what do I have to do so that that feral cat feels the peace of Reiki and feels trusting of me to step into connection? Like what do I have to do? I want every animal, even the most fearful ones, to feel safe. And I don't want to push my will on them or my agenda on them and so that you know kind of the combination of like working with people but finding instances where i was modifying the protocol for people because i had to and it worked and then you know trying to make it more more comfortable for animals and respecting them more really you know not wanting to dominate over them as the reiki healer but like really seeing it as like a shared decision making you know they can decide yes or no and you know so that was kind of where my protocol started to really um go in a, a different direction and the first thing i had to do was let go of hands and that was so hard because remember my first teacher taught me hands on reiki on 
hands off, freak you off. That was really ingrained. And so a lot of teachers still teach that, that yeah. even though there is no hands on the Reiki precepts, you know, it's all about state of mind, but a lot of because it's what defines Reiki in Western lineages, but it's so much more than that. Yes. I think in your case, you know, your practice forces you to go and let the hands because in rescue animals, shelters you cannot really touch a dog who's been abused that easily can i guess you well can. hands hands are bad for a lot of animals they've never known kindness they've been abused so when they see you with your hands they look at your hands like they're weapons it's really heartbreaking oh. you know so i thought well what if i just put my hands in my lap you know and then i'm like well where's Reiki coming from? You know, I, I was like, really, these were thoughts that I had. And I, you know, I, I began to realize that Reiki was for me, like, even if I looked at my own practice of hands-on Reiki, but what was it doing? It was changing my heart. You know, my heart that was so anxious and had so much fear was like relaxing and opening and just feeling so good. And so I'm like, you know, Reiki really touches this. So that's kind of what I say now to my students is, you know, Reiki's about touching hearts, not hands. So that was really my first scary, like, oh my God, like, am I still doing Reiki now? <laughs> was letting go of hands. But something really interesting happened when I put my hands down on my lap. Because I didn't even, this is a predatory position. So I wouldn't even be across the room like this. Because yeah. I look like I'm going to pounce and attack, right? That's true. I didn't think of that, but yeah. So the hands had to be on the lap, okay? Like not beaming, not doing anything. So hands on the lap, animals would be like, oh. And then I had a couple of animals actually come over and, and I knew like, you know, they had surgery or, you know, they had torn a muscle or a ligament in a leg or something, like a dog. They would come over and they'd actually like, look at my hands on my lap. And then they would turn around and they'd back up their stitches and sit down on my hand. Like they would literally like be <laughs> doing their own hand position, you know? And I'm like, well, I never thought, saw that coming. Like the animals will choose physical touch and they will choose it in their own way. And you know why I never saw that before was because I never made space for it to happen. No, because it's it's contrary to what we learn. And, you know, again, in, when I learned animal Reiki, like I let go of the hand because of the Japanese training later on. But at the beginning it was like you place the hand, they were even like chakras for animal. And I think I told you no more than 10, 15 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Because animals don't have mental blocks so they can get the energy faster. So my training with animals and probably they gave me like 10 minutes of training was completely insane. And then with the Japanese, uh, more about holding the space, then I realized I don't need the hands. But before that, I, and I'm really bad with chakras. So I basically could not, I could not remember where the chakras on animals were. But, but I love the fact that I, that they actually went and sat on your hands. You must have been so surprised. Yeah, I was, it was just, it was the weirdest feeling. I'm like, oh, why didn't I do this before, you know, or a horse? would come and lean into my hands and then they would move their body around and it wasn't in any like order it was just like where they felt good and I'm like wow animals actually have a have a way that they like to be you know and and not all animals came up and touched me some animals would lay down like five or ten feet away some animals some fearful dogs would come and lay down behind me and lean against my back and it was really important that I didn't turn around or look at them like I didn't even see them the whole treatment but I would feel them very gingerly lay themselves down and I would hear them you know so you know some animals didn't want to be in my line of vision some animals wanted to be you know further away some closer some in my hands and I'm like wow so if I just hold space animals decide what's comfortable for them and if I'm not pursuing some agenda then I never scare them if I just sit quietly then they're always comfortable they're always safe they're always like the trust is built so quickly 
So that was like a huge like change in my protocol. I'm like, okay, well, I can't, we can't do hands. We can't do hand positions anymore because we might offend somebody. We might come on too strong. You know, we might make an animal uncomfortable. We might lose trust. And by the way, what you said about timing, my, the first, I would say probably the first 10 years of my practice when I was really just trying to do as many Reiki treatments as possible on as many animals in barns and shelters and everything, an hour, 60 minutes, that was the ideal time. And, you know, a lot of that idea of, of short treatments is about our lack of ability to hold space. <laughs> we get impatient because nothing's happening. We're not doing a protocol, you know, so mm -hmm. let the animal gets up and leaves. So let's just finish. But guess what? You just continue to hold space. They come back. It's like an ebb and a flow. They walk in and out of the space and they come closer or further away. But if you never just sit and hold the space, you never see them come back because you, you're like, oh, it's been two minutes. They got up and walked off. So I'm done. Bye. And you leave and the animal comes in and goes, where'd she go? I came back for more Reiki. She's gone already. It's only been two minutes, right? Yeah, but that's our training. I remember they told me if the animal leaves, it's because he's ready. That's what I was told. And it's funny because my, I easily hold focus and space for 15 minutes. After that, I need to, like with, with time, I've learned to concentrate and hold the space for an hour, two hours. But 15 minutes when I'm like busy and like to make, that's my time. And so basically you're, what you're saying is that is that's the space most of us can really hold the space without any trouble yeah and that's why yeah so we blame it on the animal there is something <laughs> i love <laughs> oh let's blame the poor animals uh but there is something i love that you mentioned a lot respect the animal and then you told me about that big aha or that oops that you had that i think also is very tied to respect and, and to the animals so we love if you could share that story so yes, that's like the second um, major change in my protocol that happened. And it happened from this mistake that I was doing for such a long time. And that was, you know, really in human Reiki, I had always learned to talk to the person about what their issue is and then focus on that issue. So if they come to you and they say, Oh, my knee is really sore, then you're going to like focus the energy on the knee, put your hands around the knee. Or if they say they have a headache, then you know what I mean? If they say I'm really sad, maybe you would focus on the heart. So you're kind of talking to figure out what the issue is and you're like kind of focusing on. And of course, Reiki goes where it needs to go, but you're, you're really having a conversation about what is wrong and then you're kind of focusing your protocol sort of around that to some extent, right? And it varies with different, the way different teachers teach it, but that's kind of the way that I learned from both of my teachers initially, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. Yeah, it, so it, I would- To people to just, okay, if they say they have a headache, place their hands on the head, but don't focus, just so they feel like you listen to them but to just do the session open. But that I don't think is also very common teaching. Right, right. But you're still focusing on, you're still going, okay, here's, let's let's put our hands on the area, right? So they feel her, but yeah, yeah. I noticed with animals that, that especially horses taught me this, that the opposite was true. If a horse had um, a sore leg, if I went anywhere near that sore leg, if I even thought about that sore leg, once I let go of my hands and I was just like trying to, but my thoughts would be like, oh, the sore leg, I should, you know, tend, you know, I should offer healing energy to the sore leg. Their ears would go back. They would turn and look at me like, oh, don't think about what's wrong with me. <laughs> I'm totally fine. And they, you know, they'd walk out, you know, um, with cats, it was funny, a cat would be like, if I would go to someone's house to do Reiki on their cat, and the cat would be like sleeping, so I would stay across the room, I wouldn't disturb them, and the person would tell me, you know, they have this kidney disease, and you know, it's making them, they're not able to eat, and it's very, making them very ill, or whatever, so I would sit, and you know, we'd talk, and then I'd sit down, I'd start Reiki, and I'd start going, okay, so they have this kidney disease, and we want to heal, and they'd be all, they'd wake up, be like, I don't know who you think you are coming into my house and thinking about me as if I'm not perfect 
but I'm out of here. And they would, you know, they would totally run off, you know, and I'm like, oh, shoot. Like, <laughs> I'm like, are they really hearing my thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and they don't like you to focus on their ailments. And so I, I was like, that's really scary that I have to monitor my own thinking because they're connecting not only with what my body's doing, like I figured out, okay, stop with the hands, but like, how, how do I monitor my thoughts? And so um, I would give myself affirmations. So if an animal was really anxious, I would think about affirmations of courage. And so I was trying to like create positivity, but I was missing a piece. I was missing something. And this did not come clear to me until I got breast cancer. And I had the terrible experience of having the diagnosis and then going home and telling all your friends and family and seeing their faces and their eyes and the way they look at you completely change like this. Like no longer am I Kathleen, now I am a tumor. And when they look at me, all I see is fear, um, pity, sadness, you know, worry, like varying degrees of that from everyone who looked back at me. And it was the worst feeling. Like I felt like I had lost myself because you don't realize how much you identify with the way people look at you, especially the people that are close to you that you love and the way they see you it really is part of who you are. And when that is completely gone, I was like, where, where did Kathleen go? Like I was here all these years and now it's, you know, it, it was ex extremely painful. Like it, it, I was already terrified of what was gonna happen to me. And now all of this, it like made everything so much worse. Yeah, that is and, really difficult pain to bear on top of the physical pain. Yes. And I, but, you know, something happened, you know, as I was kind of in there, I had, let me tell you who in my life could see me still, my dog and my horse. Oh. When they look, I went to see them next. They're like, Hey mom, great to see you. This is awesome. What are we doing today? Let's go for a walk. Are we going to, we going to ride today? You know, like they were totally like, and I'm like, how come my animals can still see me? Right? That was like, and then I realized, oh my God, I have been doing this terrible thing to the shelter animals and to the animals in hospice. I've been seeing them as broken, as less than, as I've been defining them by their ailment. And when they look at me, they see reflected in my eyes, everything that's wrong. Thank and it, bro it broke my heart. You know, I realized I was in the shelter trying to do the right thing, but there to help, to support. And I was actually adding to their burden, but I never would have seen it had it not happened to me. And so I, that was the biggest mistake I ever made in my practice was defining animals and people by what's wrong with them and and really focusing on that and so that's where my protocol completely shifted again in a whole different way and so what I say now it's like the third pillar of my let animals lead method is that we focus on the animal's perfection in this moment because for me you know seeing that essence like my dog sees when he looks at me, when my horse looks at me, you know, always perfect. Doesn't matter if I'm in a bad mood, if my hair is messed up, if like, if I have cancer, like whatever it is, no, I'm perfect. And they look at me and I'm like, how do they see that essence? I need to see that essence in myself so that I can get better. Yeah. And I need to see it in the animals that I'm with. And so that I, I just vowed, I will never do that to another being like it's so painful and so that's such a big thing that I teach now um, that also is is so different in a protocol where you basically let go of whatever the diagnosis is whatever the issues are 
it's like you you acknowledge them and go okay yeah mm -hmm. but now we're doing reiki so yeah. in this space it's all bright light you are the light all is well you're perfect in this space it's filled with love and compassion and you really have to I think you have to see that in yourself before you can really see it in others. And so my, my cancer journey really taught me how, how do I see myself as the light in my darkest moments? That was just a lot of what I learned, I think, through my journey. And so it's something that I, I always tell my students, I don't want you to have to go through cancer to figure this out. So I'm telling you right now, this is how you see, you know, let go of everything that's wrong. Nothing can diminish and, and dim that beautiful light within. It's still there. Even in, in the little dog who's passing away, who's very sick, I want you to see deeper than that. See their beautiful light shine, be a, be a mirror reflect it back to them, remind them of that beautiful light. And then whatever's meant to happen in their journey, if they get well, if it's, if there, it's their time to pass, they will be embraced in the light. In, in just like my neighbor Stella said, you know, pulling them up into the light, you know, they will be embraced by that beautiful light, whatever, you know, we can't control what happens, but we can create a space that's filled with love and compassion and, and light. In, in every moment, in peace, in every moment, it's possible. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's it's a very vulnerable story, so I really appreciate you sharing it. And again, I think it's great for animals, but for me, what you are saying is basically the essence of Reiki. So I really appreciate in the beautiful way you share that. So uh, I want to get a little bit of the details because you actually created uh, the Lead the Animals uh, modality and it has some pillars. So I would love if you can explain a little bit to uh, the people listening or watching this video, what the, the protocol or your system is about. Yeah, absolutely. So the Let Animals Lead method is something that represents the evolution of my own journey um, and um, the, the little lessons that animals have taught me along the way. And the first pillar of this practice is that it's based on uh, Japanese Reiki techniques. And that of course was my um, teacher Franz, which I know you've also studied with him. And so when I studied with him, he presents Reiki as a, a meditation practice. And so that, when I learned that aspect and that slant on the different tools that we have, that really opened things up because of course with animals right you can't use the hands-on protocol anymore so it's all meditation based um, so that all those japanese teachings are really at the foundation and core of like what kind of meditations do i do i do reiki meditations <laughs> so that's so whether it's the symbols and the mantras or the hatsureho or um you know any of the the precepts even are, are taught as like a mantra. And then you, you kind of go inward with the practice and you create that radiance that the animals can step into and step out of. So the, the meditation, it's the let animals lead method is really about meditating with animals for healing. But at the base, the first pillar is those Japanese Reiki techniques. So there's that to, to kind of give us a foundation. But like I always tell my students, there's six pillars only the first one is Reiki. So it's really evolved into something more and different. And why? Because of animals, because wanting to empower animals, wanting to make them feel safe, wanting them, wanting to be able to deepen trust with them. Um, and just like really that, that sacredness of animals is really driven the rest of the pillars. So the second pillar is about touch, which I already talked about, we use touch only when animals initiate it. And that is very different than, than what others have done in the Reiki community. In the beginning, you know, touch was just done. And then people started to realize, oh, some animals don't like touch. And so we should give them a choice, which is good. But now the normal teaching is like, put your hands on the animal, but let them walk away. That's kind of 
you know, the way that the human teachings have been modified for animals. But in the let animals lead method, that's not far enough. We never want to even go there with the, with the touch if the animal doesn't 110% want it. So how do we make sure when, when, an, when we touch an animal, how do we make sure 110% the animal wants that? Let them be the one to do it. Yeah, it's like an right? animal hashtag me too in a way. Yes, they have to. Have exactly. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> and especially when you're talking about animals who have had trauma, this is not a mistake that you can afford to make because it may be very difficult or impossible to regain their trust once you've crossed that line. So, you know, your animals at home may forgive you and it's not a big deal. Yeah, they forgive everything. They're like, sweet. yeah, yeah, yeah. But but then my so then my thing is, well, this is my philosophy about that is if I'm going to give the utmost sacred respect to choice to a traumatized animal, why wouldn't I do that to the animal who is my partner in life? Wouldn't I afford them the same respect? I mean, yeah. just because they're they're nice, I shouldn't, you know, take <laughs> advantage of that. Right. So so I always say it's always animal initiated. We never cross that line. You know, trust them, trust the animal with that. And then the third pillar is about that state of mind change. So we focus on the animal's perfection. And that is very different as well. What's, what's taught a lot in the animal Reiki community now is find out the diagnosis, figure out you know, what the issues are, and then focus on those areas, either the people, some people use the chakras, some people just visualize light beaming to the sore ankle or whatever it is, but that, that focus on what's wrong. And because of my unique experience with how that feels negative <laughs> when you are suffering and struggling with something, I said, oh no, we're not doing, hell no, we're not doing that, no. The perfection we're we're going to be we're going to stand in the light and we're only going to see the light and we're going to reflect the light back and we're going to be one in the light and the light is all there is everything else just dissolves in that light so that's i call it seeing with your reiki eyes but that is really seeing being able to see that now that's not easy that's why we have to practice yeah. but but that's, that's really the goal is, you know, so the focus of our state of mind is really important when we're with animals, because again, animals sense your thoughts, they're going to become uncomfortable and resistant to connecting with you if they sense your thoughts going to what's wrong with them. Your vibration totally changes when you start going, oh my God, they have this skin condition. Or if you look at them and say, you're perfect and beautiful. I mean, and it's not beautiful. that... Yeah, and it's not that you're don't worry. Yeah. You're not you're not denying that they have a skin condition, right? But you're sa you're saying that doesn't define you. I see I see more. I see that beautiful essence of you. Oh, I love that. And then the fourth pillar, this is something that working with animals will teach you, and that is um Meditation is a way of compassion. It's not a physical body position. <laughs> so <laughs> you might, you, you've done, you do martial arts. So I know when you, when you learn like, you know, um, your forms or even your meditations to get, prepare for your forms, it's very strict. So it's like you have your, your back is straight, your, you know, everything is in alignment and that's very important. When you're working with animals, you might be in a, a barn, with a horse, you could be in a pasture with a cow, you might be sitting outside under a tree with a bird, you could be in a shelter environment and there's the public walking in and out, so you have to kind of shift where you're going. You could be walking in the forest with your dog. All of these places, it's possible to be Reiki in all these places if we understand that Reiki is not a physical position. It's our state of mind and heart. It's our way in the world. It's like a way of compassion. And animals understand that. You know, you could be, if you've ever taken like a yoga class or something, you're sitting and like everyone's meditating at the beginning 
and you have your cute little outfit on and they have music and everybody's all shiny and looking good, right? But for all you know, everybody in the class is thinking about something else entirely. They're it's mad like, about okay. something, right? <laughs> Who knows? Totally distracted, not even focused, right? And the teacher will look out and be like, yeah, look how great the class looks. And you look around, you go, yeah, everyone's so namaste. It's totally awesome, right? Nobody knows. Well, let me tell you, if you were standing in a pasture of horses and you look perfect, but mentally you're out to lunch, your heart is not in it, the animals will know like that and they will not tolerate it. They'll just be like, Ugh whatever and they'll just leave you know and you notice this oh my gosh with wild animals like meditating with tigers i work at the care foundation usually in february although i didn't get to go this year but i've been going there for 10 years working with exotic animals um, rescued animals of all like alligators crocodiles monkeys like everything they're so sensitive to your state of mind if you don't have your whole heart in it and if you're not completely like open and like in that grounded space, forget it. They will have nothing to do with you. No way. doesn't matter how great your yoga outfit is and how perfect your posture is. They're like, forget it. Yeah, there is no Instagram perfection. I think it would be a great test for all of us to train with animals and then go back to humans, right? Because you, it will change the way you hold space. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because you're like, okay, it doesn't really matter whether I'm sitting, standing, my eyes are open or closed. If I'm walking, if you're with animals, you're going to be like, if you're with horses in a pasture, you have to keep your eyes open to be safe. So you're not going to be closing your eyes. You're going to have your eyes open. You're going to be aware. I mean, animals, they're, they're prey animals. Horses yeah. are, so they can spook. And so you have to keep your wits about you, but how do you meditate while you're still present well the point of meditation is to be present i know some of us meditate to go off into la la land but that's not animals kind of show us no that's not why we meditate you know you do your thing honey but i'm not going to be involved animals will be involved when our meditation brings us here so that again that meditation is is our way of compassion but the physical position of our body is not it doesn't matter and in fact with animals we have to be really flexible if we want to be in the pig barn with pigs <laughs> you know we have to be able to sit on a bucket and move around or whatever right yeah and the pig may be chewing on your shoe so yes right exactly <laughs> <laughs> or the goat the goats chewing on your hair my students in, at bright haven used to go out with the goats and they come back and their hair would be green because the uh, goats love to chew on their hair, but they had been chewing on alfalfa <laughs> and then they chewed on their hair. And so they'd come back and I'd be all, how was your treatment? They're all, it was awesome. With big green slime in their hair. All, yes. <laughs> but then again, that is holding space, right? You're not distracted. They're chewing your hair and you steal with compassion and not yeah. worry. It's and they're, they're with you because yes. you're with them. And so the, it's an honor that they chewed on your hair because they didn't run to the other path they would run to the back of the pasture and ignore you or or headbutt you out of there right <laughs> <laughs> i love that so the fifth pillar is developing mindfulness with animals for peace and healing and for me this is really the essence of reiki practice with animals is the mindfulness so really learning to to be here now in this moment and everything we do with Reiki, if it's the precepts, if it's the Hatsureho, if it's the symbols and the mantras, you know, uh, if it's the, if we're doing hands-on healing for ourselves in the presence of animals, we're creating this space of, I'm letting go of all the other stuff and I'm here with you now, 110%. I'm here with an open heart, an open mind, I'm here. So that to me, that mindfulness is really ultimately the quality that animals seek in us. You know, I, I remember once I took some students to guide dogs for the blind to, um, to meditate with the dogs and training there. And they were so like perfectionist about their meditation practice. They were like, we were sitting in a room with the dogs walking around and they're like, you know, inward, like totally focused and everything. And at one point, one of the dogs 
came and sat in front of my student and looked at her. And she's like, she kind of opened, she felt present. She opened her eyes and she's like, no, I'm meditating. Don't bother me. I'm meditating. I'm meditating. I'm, I'm totally meditating. And then the dog's like, puts one foot on her. Looking at her. <laughs> and she's still, then the dog like licks her on the nose. And she's like, <laughs> he still like goes inward. And finally the dog's like, whatever. And he just walked away. But afterwards I was like, why didn't you engage with the dog? And she's like, well, because I was meditating. And I'm like, but what's the purpose of your meditation? And she's like, well, to connect. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, oh, okay. You know, so it was like light bulb. So really mindfulness being here now, being present. That's what every, that's what, what animals teach us. You know, we can't zone out and be floating in space if we want to be with animals. And then the, the last pillar, the sixth pillar, I think is, maybe the most important one. And that one is that we honor animals as teachers and healers in their own right. And that to me, you know, if there's anything that could heal the human animal bond on this planet, it's seeing through those eyes. Because we often see animals as products, we dominate them, we, um, we see them as, you know, well, you know, we're taking care of them, but they don't really know any better. We're like the smart ones. And spiritual practice with an animal teaches you that animals understand energy more. They're more expanded in their view. Um, they're spiritual teachers to us. And if we can see the world through the eyes of animals teaching us, even the smallest animal, even a butterfly, we can learn so much about transformation, right? From butterflies. We can start to see animals in that way. To me, that is the path towards healing for our planet because that is what our planet is missing right now is that, that harmony and, and respect and, and seeing the sacredness in, in beings that are different from ourselves, right? Such a change of paradigm, right? Because we always feel I'm going to offer Reiki to animals to save them, right? We never see them actually let me let them lead but let them be my teacher and my healer that is such a beautiful uh, change of perception that i haven't heard very much in the past and you had a beautiful experience with the snakes i don't know if you're comfortable sharing that sure yeah oh my gosh so snakes it was really funny because a lot of people hate snakes and i have to admit that i am kind of afraid of snakes as well and they're they're kind of um they're just different kind of kind of beings and some of them are venomous. And so there's this whole thing between humans and snakes, right? Where it's like, <laughs> oh my God, a snake, right? It's like, you know, and you hear the old Buddhist teachers tell stories about how you kill the snake and that represents something. And so there's just culturally folk tales, everything. Snake's always the villain, right? Look in the Bible, right? The snake yeah, yeah. Like, We're it's just here because like, of a snake, yeah. Yeah, they're, the whole, the whole, cultural paradigm with snakes is like a negative thing right so when um after i had my surgery and i went to the care foundation a, a few months after actually it was about six weeks after my surgery so i was still pretty weak and i was still in a lot of pain but i'm like no i need to go and be with the animals because it's so healing to be there and um uh, that year, I decided to go into the snake room to do Reiki with Leah. My, she's the vice president of Sarah, my best friend and, and partner. And, and so Leah and I were like, oh, let's go into the snake room. We, we haven't done that before. You know, I, I don't know why we haven't, but, you know, it's time to go in with the snakes. And they have like three walls in a room, like floor to ceiling of the glass, um, you know, cages with the snakes in them. And they have, you know, a few that you can hold um, that are tame, but a lot of them are like rattlesnakes, cobras, vipers, you know, a lot of the venomous, you know, snakes. And so it's a little intimidating to go in there and take a tour and, you know, have the cobra come up with the hood, you know, and you're like, oh my God, you know, so, but we're like, no, you know, all the animals, you know, are, you know, beautiful, bright lights. And so we should go in and do, you know, so we go in to do Reiki and Leah was on one side with the back wall and I was on the front wall, you know, and we were setting our intention to do Reiki. We're kind of back to back in there. 
And all of a sudden I had this, this feeling instead of like saying, oh, you know, I'm here to help you and support you with Reiki, whatever. I'm like, I asked for some snake medicine. I'm like, I could actually use some healing. I'm feeling like crap. I have been through a lot in the last six months. And so I just had this intuitive feeling that these snakes were healers and teachers. I knew, you know, and um, there was a rattlesnake in front in right in front of me. It was all curled up sleeping. And as soon as I set my intention, I put my hands on my Hara. He woke up and he brought his head up, you know, like this. And intuitively I brought my arm up, which was in a lot of pain after my surgery. And so we were, my arm was like this, his head was like this, you know, looking at each other through the glass and he started to dance. He started to just slowly weave back and forth. And I followed, my arm followed his, his movement. So we were like dancing together. And it was like such a powerful energetic feeling. I felt almost like I was, my horror was going to explode. Like my lower belly felt like really like dense and like weird, <laughs> but I'm like, <gasps> and then I'm like, no, this is the snake sharing. And, you know, this is an honor that he's dancing with me. We have this dance. So I'm like, I kind of let that fear go. It was kind of overwhelming, but I'm like, no, it's okay. As soon as I let my fear go, it felt good. And we just were doing this. And I noticed that I kind of stopped blinking. Like at one point I'm like, I don't think I blinked in a while. I wonder if I should, I was like, I, my eyes need lubricant. <laughs> I should blink. I just had that funny thought after like 15 or 20 minutes. And then at one point I was so focused in on him dancing. His name was Kane. He was a cane back um, rattler and he was about six feet, seven feet long, big one. I had this weird feeling that of, of like, a bigger view and I looked at the wall and every single snake was dancing with us. So there were like two or three cobras. There was a boa underneath on the bottom part. There were some other like snakes. So there was like, I don't know, 10 snakes all doing this, all of us together. And I suddenly saw this wall of snakes. And I said, um, Leah, uh, something weird is happening. <laughs> and she turned around and all the snakes went like this. I went down back into their sleeping pose and she's all, what just, what? She goes, something weird. What just happened? I'm like, I'll tell you later. I was like, oh my God. But at that moment I felt so much gratitude and I had made this weird connection with these snakes and feeling like, oh my God, like snakes show compassion to a human and are willing to connect after what we've done, after our culture, what our culture teaches, after all these years of en enmity between us. And here they are dancing with me. And when I walked out of that room, my head felt really spaced out, but my arm, the pain was like 80% gone that I had carried for like six months. Beautiful. And I was like, you know, I was brought to tears because I thought I didn't deserve that. You know, why, why did they choose to, to share anything with me and to trust me? And I really believe it's that vibration we give when we really honor them and respect them and we don't, look down on them or view them through our limited narrow lens like i think that snake the all the snakes felt i didn't see them as something scary or as something bad or as something creepy like you know and they probably thought well this is weird a human that's looking at us with these different eyes she sees us as the light that's really interesting so that's what i've really noticed with animals, whatever species it is, they, they sense and feel the way we see them. And so it's so important for us to, to open our eyes and see the light because we are all the same thing. We're all this beautiful part of this web in the, in the universe. You know, we all share that. And 
nobody's left out of it. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, snakes. No, I can never go in the snake room, Kathleen. And I'm like, I respect that. That's okay. <laughs> you don't have to go in the snake room. But I'm just saying, if you, if you did, you might be amazed. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm so grateful for you sharing that because a lot of times we say there is no giver, no receiver. A lot of times it's just we talk, right? We talk the talk. I think all your stories you're sharing today is really an incarnation of there is no giver, no receiver, but it's such a paradigm shift that no one is really talking about like a lot in Reiki. So I really love that. Like this next story for me is that, as you said, we've been hunting them, killing them, scared of them, and they can feel compassion for us, right? And that, that for me, when you say that story, and when you say that part, when she felt compassion for you, and I call the snakes all female because I'm into environment, uh, like I feel goosebumps, I'm like, this is what Reiki is about, right? It's about letting go of separation and feeling compassion and not the pity that we're trained in society to feel like I'm a good person because I feel pity. True compassion that sees the light in everything and understand we're just people dealing with things or animals or plants, right? Trying to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm so grateful for you to share all of that. And you know, if I could like beam your message to every brain in the world, I will totally do it. So hopefully <laughs> a lot of people will see this interview. Because for me, again, that is the core of the practice, right? It's not healing a knee. It's well, if we can heal a knee, like great. But this is really what is going to change the world and make us, you know, evolve us as a society. And it will be such a beautiful society. So I'm grateful. I know I have a couple more questions, but given the time, I really want to move more to your goal because I know Sarah is really important, which is your nonprofit is really important for you. So we'd love to close perhaps with a little bit of your goals. And then I'll show you the drawing uh, that I did for you. Um, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see it. Yay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so Sarah Shelter Animal Reiki Association um, was something I started um, after my dog Dakota passed away and um, it's he's kind of our mascot and it's sort of dedicated to his memory because he was a rescue dog. And he was also my first animal Reiki teacher, my most profound animal Reiki companion for you know 16 and a half years. So I thought of all the animals that are in shelters that never find a home that that you know have faced so much trauma in their life and a lot of them nobody realizes all the gifts that they have to give and all their wisdom that they have to share and all of their just the light all the light that they bring to the world you know it's like this untapped reservoir of wisdom and compassion um, in the world and so I, you know, Dakota was that for me. And I, I know, I thought, what if I never adopted him? Like I would never know. So I think of all these other animals in shelters, sanctuaries, rescued animals. And I thought, you know, what if, like, what could I do to, to help and support them and to, to recognize their light, their gifts, their wisdom. And it's like share Reiki. Is when we when when I'm sharing Reiki with animals, when I'm meditating with them, I see them as my teacher. I see them as the light. I shine that back to them, like we've talked about, and um, maybe others will see it if if I can see it and they can see me seeing it. Maybe they'll remember it, even though they've been traumatized. And you know, maybe the next person who walks through looking to adopt, maybe they will see it too. And so my goal really with Sarah is as many rescued animals on this planet as possible that we should be sharing Reiki with them. We should be in the shelters, in the sanctuaries, sitting opposite them and being the light with them. And so we have about 200 members now. We started out with like in 2008, we started. Um, so this is our 13th year. We went from about 10 members to now about 200 members. And um, we started out as a program of practitioners going in and offering treatments, volunteer, all volunteer army, going in vol and volunteering treatments. Now we have a whole education arm. So we have educational programs we offer to staff, to volunteers um, in 
many different organizations across the world. It started out just in the United States. Now we are in, we are all across the world. We're in Europe, we're in India, we are in Canada and the United States and South America. We're all, all over the place. So I'm so proud of Sarah and we're the only organization that does what we do. Not only do we volunteer teach, volunteer treatments, we also give back a percentage when we teach a class to the general public at a shelter or sanctuary, we donate 25 to 50% proceeds back to the organization. So we're also donating back hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last 10 years or 12 or 13 years of that we've been in existence. So we are financially supporting, we are supporting through treatments, Reiki treatments, we are supporting through educational programs. And these educational programs help with compassion, fatigue, stress relief for the staff, right? That's a really hard yeah. job to work there. So um, so I'm so um, honored the, 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 the crew of volunteers that we have in Sarah are the best people in the world, the best people you will ever meet in the world. They are the most amazing selfless people ever. Um, and if you wanna find out more about what we do and how to be involved, you can go to Shelter Animal Reiki Associ Association dot org that is our website perfect and people also can go because you also offer regular trainings and your books i know all your books are on amazon but you also have your regular website for training right and that yes is if you animal reiki source dot com if you want to study with me learn reiki with me learn animal reiki i have tons of different programs on there i have a blog with tons of articles i've got all my podcasts on there that you can listen in and all my books are on my website and also on Amazon. And that's where I discovered your books the first time many years ago. Yay. And it was very surprising, but I think I hadn't trained with France yet. I was training Western, so I was really intrigued, but I couldn't really understand very well what you were saying. It's incredible. Like I love how my journey was like really with bad training at the beginning because it made me a lot more compassionate and, and also value a lot more like the wisdom of people like you sharing it. So I'm, you know, I'm really grateful actually for my very bad training at the beginning. So <laughs> I wanted to share your drawing. You were talking about nature, harmony, and I included a little bit of your stories. I don't know if you can see it very well. Oh, snake. I see a snake. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. It has a pearl as well, pearl. which is from the five elements and the dragon part. Right. Then a little bit of nature i don't know if you can you see well yes that is so beautiful oh my gosh i love it thank you um, let me know if you want it color i'm doing it for the book version they're all going to be gold black and white if you want color i can scan this version and color it if you prefer it like that i'll send it like that i think it's perfect it's perfect thank the way you. it is i absolutely love it I love doing it and like i did it after our conversation so i really really appreciate your time Caitlin, honestly, like it's been for me, it's been a very moving experience being able to chat and sharing your message. I'm really, really grateful. And I hope the whole world hears a lot more from you. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for giving me this platform to share what I love and, you know, hopefully to bring more people into that possibility of seeing animals in, in a more sacred way. I think it's, it's what our planet needs right now. I do agree. And I'm taking your lessons from my own personal, like Reiki with people. So, and obviously my dog, he's always been a Reiki horse, so, but he's always decided what he wants. So now I know that's the right way and let him. <laughs> <laughs> he's very bossy. Thank you so, so much. Have a great evening. Thank um, you. I'll miss you already. Like I'm, you know, I'm like that with the interviews. I don't want them to end ever. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.